One of wrestling's awe-inspiring giants, King Kong Kirk, shockingly died in the ring. Here's a look back at the sadly shortened life of this British behemoth. Before adopting the King Kong moniker, Malcolm Kirk began his wrestling career as Mucky Malkirk and also adopted the early ring names Kojak, Kirk, and Killer Kirk. Kirk's most notable achievement as a pro might just be the fact that his career spanned 20 years. He used an elbow drop as his finisher and had an overall style that can best be described as brawling. He wasn't tremendously successful from a win-loss record perspective, but that goes with the territory when you work your entire career as a heel, often pitted against the respective territory's top babyfaces and champions. The original King Kong fell off the Empire State Building, after all. Kirk's work as a heel was highly regarded, though. He was noted for his ability to incite a crowd without a word or direct gesture. His look and villainous presence was enough. He's remembered for being the type of heel that would terrify children in the audience, but was also credible enough from a size and ability perspective to make it mean something when his babyface opponent would eventually prevail. Known as the One Man Riot Squad, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, King Kong Kirk. A native of Street House, West Yorkshire, England, Malcolm Kirk worked as a coal miner before embarking on a professional rugby career. Both professions were fitting of the gritty, tough persona he would adopt in the ring. He played 35 of his 37 professional rugby matches as a member of the Featherstone Rovers, scoring one try and one penalty kick. Kirk was affiliated with three other pro teams between 1955 and 1961, Wakefield, Castleford, and Doncaster, where Kirk would play alongside Ted Heath, who also went on to become a professional wrestler. As Kirk's wrestling career progressed, largely throughout the United Kingdom but also in Germany, Canada, and a short stint in the United States, he would work as a bouncer on the side. In 1974, he was cast in an Italian film, the title of which translates to I'm for the Hippopotamus. Kirk was credited as Ormond's bald henchman, with Ormond being one of the primary villains. Clearly, Kirk's unique look endeared him to director Italo Zingarelli, and he got to work alongside the film's protagonists, portrayed by Terence Hill and Bud Spencer, an Italian comedy team still revered to this day. Oh, something and hide here. Oh, oh. Kirk wrestled most of his career as a singles performer, but he did have a handful of tag matches to his credit. Many of his allies and opponents would go on to considerable fame in wrestling. In 1981, Kirk teamed up with Jim Harris, who would become known as Kamala in WWE and WCW, and Sugar Bear Harris in several other territories. Kirk also teamed with the super heavyweight Giant Haystacks on three occasions, winning twice. Haystacks would debut in WCW in 1996 as Loch Ness, part of the Dungeon of Doom stable and their feud against Hulk Hogan, departing the company after a loss to the Giant at Uncensored later that year. Among Kirk's better-known opponents were High Chief Peter Maivia, Pat Patterson, a pre-Vader Leanne White, Afa and Sika, a pre-Sergeant Slaughter Bob Remus, none other than Andre the Giant, and even Bret Hart. Andre would best Kirk twice in singles competition and prevailed in two battle royals featuring both men in 1974. Five years later, Kirk would team with Rasputin against Andre in three handicap matches. Andre won all three. Hart and Kirk faced each other twice in 1981, with Kirk getting a win in the first encounter and Hart prevailing via disqualification in the second. Recalling their time in the ring together, Hart would write in his book Hitman, My Real Life in the Cartoon World of Wrestling, Kirk turned out to be a great worker and bump taker, and when he collapsed on top of me, he was as light as if he'd covered me with a blanket. On the night of August 23, 1987, the 51-year-old Kirk was set to team with King Kendo against Steve Crabtree and Shirley Big Daddy Crabtree at an event in Great Yarmouth, England. Kirk had faced Big Daddy, a huge fan favorite in the region, no less than seven times in various tag matches over the years. He was the perfect foil for Big Daddy's heroic character. With the match nearing its end and both men exhausted, Big Daddy sent Kirk to the ground and hit his splashdown finisher, a standing splash for the pinfall. As Big Daddy stood up to celebrate, it was clear that something had gone terribly wrong. Kirk lay flat, quickly turning purple. Big Daddy, realizing something went awry, alerted bystanders, including his brother, promoter Max Crabtree. Several people attempted CPR as they awaited an ambulance. Kirk died en route to the hospital. He had apparently had a series of small heart attacks followed by a massive one that killed him that night. Eight men had to dismantle the ring to get Kirk onto the stretcher and into the ambulance, but everyone's efforts sadly went for naught. Malcolm King Kong Kirk was gone at just 51.
Big Daddy was questioned by police but not charged. Kirk's autopsy revealed a pre-existing heart condition and his official cause of death was natural causes. The pathologist on the case, Dr. Norman Ball, specified six previously undetected heart attacks prior to what Kirk suffered in the ring, and even hypothesized that the one that killed him happened before he even took Big Daddy's finishing move. Kirk was laid to rest in Featherstone, and hundreds of people came to mourn, including wrestlers from across the UK. There were outcries that Kirk shouldn't have been allowed to wrestle at his age, size, and physical condition, and the British Medical Association proposed an age limit for professional wrestlers. Big Daddy Crabtree initially stayed in character when asked about Kirk's death and wrestled soon after, drawing some criticism. But it's clear that he took Kirk's death hard. As long as I live, I'll never forget seeing him laid down there on the canvas uh, instead of on his feet raging. Malcolm Kirk is survived by his daughter Natasha, who attended a wrestler's reunion event in Leeds in 2017 to learn more about her dad. She told the BBC, I don't remember my dad, so I'm grateful for these memories. He was a household name, and I think sometimes I forget that because I've grown up out of that limelight. I can't have my dad in my life and I've grown up without him, so meeting his fellow wrestlers is the next best thing because people are telling me what he was like.